Welcome, everybody, to Conversations That Matter. I'm your host, Alex Newman. We have a very special guest with us today. We've never had him on before, but I have worked with him before. He and I actually worked on this book here, uh, World Federalism 101 in Their Own Words and Deeds. I wrote uh, an introduction to it, and uh, it's fascinating information. In fact, uh, uh, Rick, our guest, taught me a lot of this, uh, stuff that I was not aware of. Uh, in fact, I don't know anybody who knows as much about this World Federalist Movement and the uh, Atlantic Union Movement as he does. Uh, a little background before we bring him on. Uh, he has uh, been studying world order strategy uh, for well over two decades. Uh, he got a, a political science degree from the University of Washington, and then he studied international relations at the graduate level. Then he served as executive director of the Association to Unite the Democracies, and uh, he has drafted numerous publications on the legislative history of the world government movement in the U.S. Congress. Uh, he's definitely a subject matter expert on this all and the Atlantic Union idea. He even hosts the Atlantic uh, Atlantica Now community on Locals.com. By the way, if you go to Locals.com, join the uh, the New Americans Locals account. We would love to have you there and you can interact with our writers and all that great stuff. Uh, Rick, thank you for coming on the program. Great to have you. Um, you know, I want to start with the world federalism stuff. Uh, you know more about this than uh, anybody I know, actually. And uh, in this book, it's just, you know, item after item, just stuff straight out of the congressional record where you're showing that uh, even back in the 40s and the 50s, these uh, globalists were much more open about their desire to create a one world government and, and merging the United States and Europe as a means to an end of creating a one world government. Uh, I know you're not necessarily opposed. In fact, I think you support the idea of a transatlantic union between the United States and Europe, but um, more from the libertarian side of things than the kind of totalitarian globalist model. But tell us about the the history. I mean, this is well documented huh, that these people wanted to build a world government. Well, it's quite interesting. You have to go back to 1910 uh, with uh, the World Federations League of the New York uh, Peace Society that was under the leadership of uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie. Uh, so in 1910, uh, uh, Honorary Richard Alpert, I mean, uh, you know, he, uh, there was this, this one, uh, gosh, for this, well, his, I can't remember his name, but he introduced a resolution trying to create a, a some kind of a world federation to achieve general and complete disarmament to prevent World War I. So after World War I happened, uh, then that's where we started, you know, transforming things into the League of Nations. And, you know, there's the, you know, the League to Enforce Peace was established with a lot of these world federalist types, and they were really pushing hard for a world federation, but, and they saw the League of Nations as a kind of a stepping stone to a much larger, you know, world government. Uh, and then the reality is, is the United States didn't, didn't ratify, you know, the League of Nations, you know, you know, partly because of Senator, you know, Senator Bora. Uh, and so they, then we just kind of went through, you know, this 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 in the second iteration of World War, uh, but there was a, a man named Clarence K. Stride, 1939. You know, he was a New York uh, a New York Times correspondent, uh, and he was covering the league, and he proposed this idea of an Atlantic Union to prevent World War II. Uh, he saw that you know, the rise of Nazi Germany, and he was like, well, let's federate the free and create some kind of a you know a, you know a nucleus of a world federation that can expand peacefully around you know the, the world as nations grew you know grew ripe for it as they adopted democratic principles as such so that particular idea didn't didn't spawn too well world war 2 started september 39 you start moving into uh, you know the 1942 as the war was raging the united states is in after pearl harbor and you have Grenville Clark, uh, you have uh, John Foster Dulles, you have Clarence K. Strait, uh, Strait and the Atlantic Union idea being presented to, the, to, to Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt liked the idea, uh, but unfortunately he had to deal with uh, Stalin at the time, you know, with the realities of, uh, of the Cold War, I mean, the emerging Cold War. Uh, so of course they had, everyone had to settle for the, you know, the United Nations. That there's a lot of world federalists who were upset about that and they kind of saw, you know, the, the, they had to see the United Nations as a stepping stone to a much larger world federation. Uh, so it, right after, you know, in, in, in like 90, 1945, when the United Nations was actually established, uh, you know, Senator Glenn Taylor of Idaho, you know, he went ahead and introduced the first World Federalist Resolution, you know, after World War II. Uh, and it, it things kind of germinated, uh, you know, once we realized that the United Nations wasn't going to live up to its expectations, Cold War started heating up. There's a lot of fear because of because of uh, you know of this nu nuclear war, and so the United World Federalist emerged along with Federal Union under the, under the Clay, you know, Clarence K. Stride, 
And what they ended up doing is is introducing resolutions uh, you know, in Congress to try to, to try to either transform the United Nations into World Federation, or once NATO was established, to transform NATO into Atlantic Union. Uh, based on federalist principles. Uh, so that's kind of where it starts. Now, a lot of the you know, so well, Strite, you know, he set up this group called Federal Union uh, Incorporated. And then it's, and under with Senator Kefauver, he was a, a famous senator from Tennessee. He was uh, working with the Atlantic Union Committee, which had Will Clayton and had uh, former Justice uh, Owen J. Roberts. Uh, and what they did is that they kind of pressured Senator Kefauver and, you know, to introduce the Atlantic Union Resolution, which was going to use the convention approach to create this this Atlantic Union, to try to you know try to federate you know, create create a true federation out of the Atlantic community, and so you know the, the book that I that that we that we worked on kind of documents the, you know the, the legislative history of the of the Atlantic Union resolution as well as the World Federalist Resolution. Uh, so the, the World Federalist Resolution was focused on going into Article One or Nine of the of the of, of the UN Charter. Uh, to transform that into and use that as a kind of a world conference to kind of reform the UN, whereas the the the, the idea of Strite was to go back and use the the same approach the founding fathers used in 1787 to kind of draft some transatlantic uh, union and have the nations of the world kind of you know that that are want to participate in it kind of ratify that. So that's kind of you know so this this movement lasted from about 1949 to around 1980. So, you know, the first half of it was Senator Kefauver with the Atlantic Union Committee, and they spawned the, the uh, you know, the passage of the U.S. Citizens Commission on NATO bill, uh, which led to the Atlantic Convention of 92, I mean, of 1962. Uh, that didn't, you know, germinate too many ideas. Uh, but then what, what, what eventually happened is uh, Representative Paul Finley picked up the mantle around 64, and they worked, uh, you know, throughout the years up until about 1980 to try to pass this Atlantic Union resolution to create this, you know, convention to, you know, to, to create this, this federal union that everybody was dreaming of. Yeah, uh, one of the things that I thought was so interesting, and I learned from you, uh, from actually working on this book with you, uh, World Federalism 101, uh, was about Europe. Um, you know, I didn't realize that uh, the globalists in the United States had concluded that uh, the Europeans weren't ready to join a federal union with the United States because they thought they, their little small countries would be kind of subsumed under the dominance of the U.S. And so the U.S. government decided as a matter of official policy and used the Marshall Plan and other things uh, as a means to uniting the nations of Europe under a basically a European super state uh, as a means for eventually merging that with the United States. So talk a little bit about that history. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really curious about this. Do you think this movement is still alive? Because we've seen the uh, the transatlantic trade and investment partnership. They want to set up these transatlantic bureaucracies, these transatlantic tribunals. Uh, is this all an extension of that or is this a new movement? Uh well, let's let me let's just uh, let me unpack that a little bit. Uh, go back to you know kind of the Atlantic Union idea and the idea of, of European Federation. Uh, so there's there's like three different uh, you, know, th you know different movements going on at the same time. You have the World Federalists trying to you know transform the UN into a world government. You have the Atlantic Union uh, Unionists trying to create you know transform NATO into a federal union. And then you also have the, you know, the, the, the a, a union to say, hey, let's just federate Europe first. Let's just use they call it the dumbbell approach. So that was uh, most, you know, mostly uh, J. W. Fulbright. Fulbright really liked that idea because he felt a united Europe could easily partner, uh, you know, with you know the the uh, the United States to form a federal union. Uh, so that was kind of like a stepping stone approach. Uh, so. When, when I think of guys like Nixon, Nixon was Atlantic Federalist. He wanted to create a true Atlantic Federal, you know, federation where the individual was the was the pure, uh, you know, foundation of of that union. Uh, then I look at John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy, as a representative, he sponsored the World Federalist Resolution. Uh, but when he became president, uh, he tried to you know to introduce general and complete disarmament, but was met by serious you know fierce resistance from the Soviets. So he kind of transitioned over to the Atlantic Union idea, but instead of embracing the Federalist model, he kind of embraced the idea of like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and, and and allow Europe to federate first, and then once Europe federates, then we're prepared to create Atlantic partnership that could eventually you know spawn Atlantic Union idea. Uh, so the federal I, I, that, I think that approach was was quite popular because in 1960 when when the US citizens on you know citizen commission on NATO resolution was was passed uh the Atlantic Union committee the members Will Clayton Christian Herter 
uh, they became they became co-chairs of this. And there was that there was a, a period there in 61 uh, where there was a shift towards liberalized, truly liberalizing trade, you know, dropping our tariffs to practically nothing uh, in order to bring a lot of these third world countries, you know, into the Western world. So we, so we saw this gift, you know, of, of free trade as a way of, 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 of rising the, the standard of living in the third world so they wouldn't be sub, you know, subject to, you know, uh, you know communist uh, infiltration. So that was really popular. Then when the Atlantic Convention of 1962 came in, all of these delegate, citizen delegates that were appointed by by you know, by their you know, national delegation, I mean their national governments, they were act, acting in an unofficial capacity. But all they could really, their Declaration of Paris, which they they came up with, really kind of drafted a more European Union like you know type of uh, you, know, you know function. And so after that, you know, John F. Kennedy was a night, you know, like you can go back to July 4th, 1962, and his Declaration of Interdependence speech, where he clearly says the Atlantic Union is his goal, but he really wants to focus on Europe, European Federation first. Uh, but what happens is, is that, you know, right around after you know, Kennedy's assassinated, Kennedy, I mean, Johnson gets us into, into the, uh, the Vietnam War, and Nixon, fin when Nixon finally becomes president, the, the Atlantic Union idea based on federalist principles, you know, you know, fi finally kind of emerges as, as, as a focus in Congress. It was very popular. Uh, but there was votes in 73 uh, where they just they just barely missed a vote to have an Atlantic Union resolution. But what I what I see, my, my personal view is what happened is at that point is is when the Trilateral Commission came into play in the in about 73, and it was clear that Congress wasn't going to pass Atlantic Union resolution. It seems like the, the what we call what I call globalists truly emerged. Uh, these people who who basically said, hey, we don't want an Atlantic Federation. We want some kind of a free trade agreement where we get to circumvent national national rules and make our own rules. They don't want anybody above them. So all of a sudden. They, they they're like pushing for you know a trilateral approach, you know with with uh, Europe and you know and, and with with Japan and th those areas around that seventies time frame. Uh, so I don't really think that the Atlantic Union movement, in the sense of federalism, is active today. I think what's what's far worse is because when the Atlantic Union idea kind of died out in 1980, it's it really spawned you know neoconservatism. It really spawned you know globalism. This idea that you know that uh, there's no reason to have any power above us, and we can create this animal farm type of economic system where where globalists are more equal than others, and that's kind of the world we live in. So to, you know when you look at the World Economic Forum and what they're trying to do. I mean, they're trying to extend their 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 rules based international order, which which they draft the rules, uh, and and so the chances of, of of a federal structure where where people actually have a say that can actually vote for people, is probably not going to come to fruition. Uh, so I, I see more of a you know a global you know global governance type of model where you have these you know these uh, nation state you know you type free trade agreements that slowly but slow you know and, and, slow, and surely constrict freedom. An economic, you know, opportunity for for the masses, and just allow a very discreet, you know, elite class to kind of rule the world. Yeah, uh, we're we're over time already, Rick. But I have a, another question I really want to ask you, and then uh, just tell us where to find more information, your websites and stuff. Sure. But um, you know, you used to run with these people, uh, as as I mentioned when uh, introducing you, you were um, the executive director of the association to unite the democracy. So uh, you ran in circles with a lot of these people that wanted to kind of tie the United States up with uh, with Europe and things. Um, but uh, and I don't know if I'm revealing too much here, but you told me one day that then you realized that these people did not. Believe believe in individual liberty. They did not believe in individual freedom. And so you parted ways with them. Uh, what do these people want, you think, ultimately? Um, and then uh, how can people learn more uh, from, from your research? Well, the, the people uh, that, that I, I work with, you know, good intentioned people, but they are globalists. Uh, they do believe in Keynesian economic theory. Uh, they, they are under the impression that socialism is much more popular uh, than, than uh, capitalism. Uh, so they're they're more socialist in their thinking. Uh, so I was actually, to some degree, kind of booted out of the or the organization because of my of my patriot you know past. Uh, so yes, I mean these. I mean I I see them. And it is, you know, these types of groups are very dangerous because they're academic based. Uh, you know, you know, they, everyone's hit with a good idea fairy. 
Uh, and <laughs> and they, they like they like widening and deepening things. I mean, so the more that they can integrate things and make suggestions on, well, NATO does this, you know, and the OSCE does this, and the OECD does this, and UN does that, all they're really doing is creating more uh, interdependence between these non-government organizations that are really run by the interests of people supporting the one percent. Uh, and so there's never a way for the people to rise above, you know, you know these 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 multinationals. Uh, so I I think that they're most of these people behind the scenes, people I work with, truly want to you know create a you know a just world, uh, but what they don't realize is that they're just being they're just patsies of a much larger globalist movement that that sees their efforts as a way of of just making you know the, the that animal farm you know mentality you know you know you know, you know come to fruition. Yeah. Uh, and Rick, uh, what's the best way to find you? You have the, the community on Locals now, the uh, Atlantica now. Uh, how can people follow your work? Um, is there any way for people to get the information in this book? I know you said Amazon uh, canceled you, but is there any way for people to get more uh, from your research? Absolutely. I, I set up AtlanticaNow.Locals.com, and I'm going to be posting all of our the, the material that I have on that website. So if people want to see the congressional you know record, they want to see the hearings and the reports, and they want to see the, the, the publications that I've written and there's some of the publication that we co-authored, co I'll post that on that website. Excellent. Uh, Rick Biondi, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for sharing uh, your many decades of research into this very, very important subject that uh, very few people know about and understand. Really appreciate you coming on. Thank you once again. Okay, thank you. All righty, folks, that's Rick Biondi, um, expert on all things um, Atlantic Federation. Uh, very interesting background. He's got degrees and uh, other things in uh, political science. Uh, fascinating individual. I'm Alex Newman. This is Conversations That Matter. Thank you so much for tuning in and uh, keep tuning in. Go to our locals too. The New American has a, a locals account. You can follow us there. You can even interact with the writers. Uh, hope you will join us over there. Thanks again. God bless you all.